So, if I didn't mention it before, I am Pastor Chris. You are at Glory Baptist Church, and I think you are at the right place this morning to give praise and thanks. If you haven't heard in what we've been talking about, this Thanksgiving has really been our theme, especially this morning, but for weeks, in fact. Um, this last week was Thanksgiving on Thursday. We, we know that, right? Um, some of us are still eating turkey sandwiches with leftover cranberries and all of that from Thanksgiving. It's a, it's a great week to give thanks. And so what else would I preach on today but Thanksgiving, right? We're going to be in Ephesians uh, 5, 19 through 20 is going to be the focus verse today. I'll have a number of other verses I'll reference. But Ephesians um, 5, 19 through 20 is the primary verse there. Um, the following proclamation that I'll read for you was made by Governor Bradford. Is he related, Gary? <laughs> I don't know. Governor Bradford. Uh, Governor Bradford, um, I know these stories pretty well. I, if you don't know, I came here from a congregational church. The Congregationalists are the pilgrim people. They trace their roots to the Mayflower. And so I kind of got familiar with the Mayflower and pilgrims and all that over the eight-ish years that I served in that church. But Governor Bradford in 1623, three years after the pilgrims had settled in Plymouth, uh, made this proclamation. It says, To all ye pilgrims, Inasmuch as the Great Father has given us this year an abundant harvest of Indian corn, wheat, peas, squashes, and garden vegetables, and has made the forests to abound with game, and the sea with fish and clams, and inasmuch as he has protected us from the raids of the savages, has spared us from the pestilence and disease, has granted us freedom of worship of God, according to the dictates of our own conscience, now I, your magistrate, do proclaim that all ye pilgrims, with your wives and ye little ones, do gather at ye meeting house on ye hill between the hours of nine and twelve, on the day of November, uh, Thursday, November 29th, uh, year, year of our Lord, 1623, and the third year since ye pilgrims landed on ye Plymouth Rock, there to listen to ye pastor and render thanksgiving to ye Almighty for all, to God for all of his blessing. Amen. Right? Since the foundation, the beginning of the primary inhabitation of our country, Thanksgiving has been part of the culture of, of our people of America. Now, as I said, this past Thursday, we all know, was Thanksgiving. And it's one of those days that, that we kind of, like the pilgrims, we like to set aside a little bit of time in our busy schedules to pause, to give thanks to God, right? And, and that is a, that's a really a great thing to do. But the Word of God, you see, tells us that this shouldn't be just like one day out of the year, right? That this idea of thanksgiving in Scripture, we're told, is to be continual, to be daily. It's to be an attitude in which we live with, right? Ephesians five nineteen through 20 tells Christians to speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus. And then we see this in, in 1 Thessalonians five sixteen through 18. Paul writes this. Paul says, Be joyful always and pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And Paul knew some things about praising God when things weren't going well, right? Paul's main subject here is praise and thanksgiving. Notice the important words that he uses in this passage. He says, always, continually, in all circumstances. Kind of sounds like Paul might be talking about, you know, at the very least, a church service, right? Especially with that Ephesians part, the speak to one another with psalms and speak to another, one another with hymns and spiritual songs and sing and make glad music in your heart, right? But Paul isn't really actually talking about a worship service. He's talking about this continual, ongoing attitude for Christians, an attitude of our hearts. How we are supposed to 
relate to one another, to be with one another. But you might wonder, right? How can we have this attitude continually, right, Pastor? I mean, how am I to give thanks to be joyful in all circumstances? That can be tough. It can be tough when I got the phone call and my mom has to have major surgery. It can be tough when you get that call from your boss and says, we're losing our jobs. It can be tough when the kids call. It can be tough when life doesn't go just as we had planned according to our desires. It can be tough. But the answer lies in our perspective of thanksgiving. We need to have the proper perspective. Only then will we be able to give thanks to God in all circumstances, always. Now, I believe there's kind of at least three, at the very least, attitudes that steal from us, that take away from us our ability to have gratitude. Three things that really, in this world, keep us from being thankful. The first one is a simple one. One of the key things that keeps us from being thankful is our own stupid pride, right? This is the attitude that says, nobody ever gave me anything. I worked hard for everything that I have, right? I studied hard. I worked hard. I earned it. It's mine. It's mine. It's all mine. Because I did it. Me, 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 me. With this kind of attitude... We feel as if we have no one but ourselves to thank. Another attitude that keeps us from being thankful is that attitude of a critical spirit or of constant complaining. It's hard to be thankful if you're constantly complaining, right? Instead of being grateful, this person will always find something to complain about. There was a a, a lady who was known throughout the community just to be an incurable grumbler, constantly complaining about everything. And at last, her pastor thought he had finally found something that she would truly be happy about. For, for you see, the word had come in that her farm was having the best harvest of all throughout the region. And, and her, her potatoes were growing like crazy the best potato crop they'd ever had. And so when he saw her next, he was just beaming with a smile, this pastor was, and he says, Mary, you must be incredibly happy. Everyone in town is talking about how healthy your crops are and how wonderful your potatoes look this year. She looked at him, scowled a little bit. True, pastor, they are pretty good. But what am I going to do when I have to feed the hogs? They were all good ones, right? Some people can find something in anything to complain about. The third attitude that keeps us from being grateful, the third attitude that steals from our ability to give thanks is one I know we all fall prey to at times, is simple carelessness. Sometimes we are careless. Someone once said that if the stars in the sky only came out one night out of the year, we would all go outside and stand there and watch it till the show was over. But they're there every night, aren't they? And we, we, we become accustomed to that. I was reminded of this just last night. We were driving home from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We were in southern Minnesota. And I said to my wife and son who were riding in the back seat, I said, hey, look. It's a prairie sunset. If you've never lived on the prairie, you don't know what a sunset is. But when you live on the prairie, meh, it's another sunset. You see them every day. Where my house is now, I got big, beautiful white pines, but they block all the sunlight. I can't, like after about, I don't know, four o'clock, I can't see the sun anymore. It's gone. I don't see all the beautiful colors on the low sky, so you forget about it. 
But as we were driving, it was the deep, dark indigo, the purple, the, 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 the blues, into the dark reds, into the reds, into the orange, into the yellow, and the pink, and the clouds, the few little clouds there were, were sparkling with color, like some artist had just painted this beautiful picture for us. And I was just looking at it through the rearview window. So you know it had to be pretty darn good if you were looking at it in person straight on. It's easy for us to become careless. The Israelites, right? Speaking biblically, the Israelites grumbled. We know that they were grumblers. They grumbled, God, we have no food. We're hungry. So what did God do? Miraculously, God sends manna each and every day. Manna coming down from the heavens to the ground every single day, except for the Sabbath. Their, their, their perfect needs are provided for everything they needed. Their bellies were rumbling and they were grumbling. And here's your solution. Praise the Lord, it's a miracle. But then they started to grumble. I'm tired of manna. Three times a day, manna. Morning, noon, night, manna. Can we have something else? They no longer saw it as a miracle, right? It was a miracle straight from God each and every day, but they were no longer satisfied with it. Because of pride or carelessness or critical spirit, if we are not careful, we too will never truly be thankful for all that God has given us. How many of you know who Rudyard Kipling is? Or the Jungle Book, right? A bunch of other stuff, but Jungle Book is one most people know. A great writer, incredible poet. Um, many of us have enjoyed his writings over the years. I, I love Kipling. I love poetry. Um, and Kipling was one of the kind of rare guys of his era who were writers who were able to enjoy the fruits of their labors while they still lived. A lot of those artists of that time... They'd create all this great content, die, and then somebody would go, oh, look, this guy was really good. But the artist never really got any of the money from it. But Kipling was one of the rare ones who was very incredibly successful during his lifetime. And so he made all kinds of money, got to enjoy life, um, was, was incredibly well-renowned uh, during his time. And so one time there was a newspaper reporter, as told, had come up to him. And he said, Mr. Kipling, I just read that somebody calculated of all the money that you have made from your writings amount to being roughly a hundred dollars per word. Uh, back in those days, that was a lot of money. hundred dollars per word, Mr. Kipling. Well, Mr. Kipling was like, he raised his eyebrows and said, I wasn't aware of that. The reporter was kind of a cynic and so he reached down into his pocket. I don't know where he got it, but the story is told, he pulled out a fresh, crisp $100 bill, waved it in front of Mr. Kipling and said, here's a $100 bill, Mr. Kipling. Now give me one of your $100 words. It's told that Kipling took it, stuffed it in his pocket, thanks, and walked off. <laughs> right? That's the story. I wasn't there. I don't know if it's true, but that's what they say. But he's Right? The word thanks is certainly at least a $100 word, isn't it? It's probably a million-dollar word. It's a word that too seldom we use, too seldom we hear, too rarely spoken and too often forgotten. If we would just adopt an attitude of thanksgiving into our lives, our lives would truly be changed. It would help us savor each and every day. If any nation should be thankful to God and be grateful for His goodness, it should be America, right? And if any people in America ought to be thankful, ought to be grateful to God for what He has done, for what He has given out of His goodness, if any people should be thankful in America, it should be Christians. So this morning I'd like to share with you just three things, and you'll find these in your sermon notes that you can fill out. Three things that we learn about thanksgiving from the Bible. The first one is simple. Thanksgiving should be expressed. 
One of the choruses that you'll hear sung in various songs in different places, and we sing this, it comes from Psalm 100. And it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart, right? And David says in Psalm 107, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever, right? You've sung that song. We should express our thanks to God and to others. This, not this last Wednesday, but the Wednesday before I was teaching the kids upstairs here. Well, I guess I was teaching them downstairs. And accidentally I picked the wrong lesson. The teachers had prepared one and I taught something different. So I'm thankful for their grace. But I happened to pick this lesson that I should be teaching this week that ties in with my sermon this week. It comes from Luke 17. And it's a story about ten men who were healed by Jesus of leprosy. Now out of those ten men, one and only one of those ten men who had been healed of a, a disease that was unimaginable in those times, made you a social outcast, condemned you to die lonely and miserable. Out of the ten men who were miraculously healed, one, only one, just one man came back and said, thank you. Jesus says, where are the other nine? See, this man was the only one willing to come back, to take the time to go back to Jesus and say thank you. Because of that, Jesus says to him, because he had gotten down on his knees, fell on the ground before Jesus. Jesus says to the man, he says, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. You ever wondered why Jesus said that? I mean, like all the other guys, the man was already healed, right? All ten of them were healed. They'd gone to the priests. They were healed physically. All of the men healed of their leprosy. But then Jesus says to this one man, your faith has made you well. You see, Jesus wasn't just talking about only this physical healing. All of them benefited from that. But he was talking about a spiritual one as well. This man was healed and whole, not healed and still broken. We too are made whole by our thanksgiving. Psychologists today tell us that sincere gratitude, that true thanksgiving, is the healthiest of all human emotions. There's a man by the name of Hans Saley who's uh, who's considered to be the the kind of founding father, so to speak, of stress studies. He studies what stress does to our psyche and our bodies. And he has said that the gratitude process that we go through when we are thankful, when we are grateful and thankful, has more emotional energy than any other attitude that we will experience in life. And a thankful heart not only helps us, but a thankful heart will endure us to others as well. See, Thanksgiving is not only good for the giver, but it's good for the receiver, right? God appreciates our Thanksgiving because it lifts him up, it glorifies him. And Thanksgiving endears him to us. It draws us and him closer to one another. And if we, if we aren't grateful, if we don't express our thanksgiving, the Bible tells us then it can, ha- in fact, have the very opposite effect. Romans one twenty one says this. Paul writes, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. This passage seems to imply that people who are ungrateful to God will soon fall away. Their hearts will become hardened by not being thankful for what God has done. Here we see pride 
interfering, pride keeping people from worshiping God and being thankful. Before we leave this point that thanksgiving should be expressed, let me list just a couple of ways that we can say thank you to God. There's lots, but I'll give you a few ideas. You can say thank you to God when you spend time with him, right? Not just an hour a week on Sundays, but when you spend time with God. That's a way to say thank you, God. You can say thank you to God when you forgive others. You can say thank you to God when you serve his church, with his church, in his church. You can say thank you to God when you share the plan of salvation with somebody. You can say thank you to God when you reach out to someone who is hurting. You say thank you to God each and every time you give the best of your time, your treasure, and your talents. And you say thank you to God when you praise Him enthusiastically from your heart. Now there are certainly other ways. There's a few ideas for how this week you give thanks to God and express it. The second line in your notes there. Our thanksgiving should be expansive. Expansive. Not expensive. Expansive. And as our thanksgiving expands, it should include a few things. First, it should include the blessings of life. I love my wife, right? Truly love her, special lady, wonderful mother, great companion in ministry, <coughs> Excuse me, tremendous teacher, just a servant heart, lots of good skills and gifts and things that I don't have. So, good compliment to me. And the one thing that she regularly gives thanks for is she stands in our kitchen in front of the sink watching dishes going, thank you, Jesus, for dishes. Right? Wrong. (laughs) Artis is getting it. She, she, She doesn't praise God for dishes. Or a husband who absolutely abhors doing dishes. She doesn't thank God for that part of me. We we don't have a dishwasher. We wash wash them all by hand. Who thanks God for dishes like that, right? But as Artis was kind of saying, we should. A, a, A sink full of dirty dishes usually means that we've been blessed by God. We had food. We have water. Right? And in this climate, we have heat to keep the water from being frozen. And clean dishes means that I've been blessed with a wife who loves me. That's an extra blessing for me. Do you realize that in our world, one in nine people go to bed hungry? Like hungry, not not like I wish I had a little bit more, but hungry. Over a billion people in our world don't have enough food to eat every single day. I mean, there's some people who don't have enough food to eat a couple days a week, but there's a billion people on this spinning ball of mud that we live on that every single day don't have enough to eat. What blessings are we really thankful for? You might have seen my Facebook post this week. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Right? Many of you know that song. My generation doesn't know that song. I didn't learn that song until I started as a pastor serving in nursing homes. That's one of the number one top ten hits of all time at nursing homes. Count your blessings. I, I didn't know. I started going around to nursing homes and they're all like, Give us count your blessings. Okay. All right, we can do that. That's one of the most requested songs. Count your blessings. Give thanks to God. Our thanksgiving should also include 
giving thanks to God for the benefit of our lives as well. See, when the Israelites focused on what they didn't have, when you focus on what you don't have, you, you, you fail to see all of the things that you do have, right? We are constantly adding to our prayer list, but more and more we should be adding to our praise list. Nothing wrong with having a long prayer list. But if your prayer list outnumbers your praise list, it might be time for some self-examination. Oh, we all have difficult times. Maybe even times where we've even despaired life itself. But if we are really looking at the benefits of life, I think each and every one of us will see that it's good to be alive, to feel the, the wind in our hair, the sun on our face, the smells of autumn, of the leaves that have fallen. To see the sunrise or the sunset. To hear the cry of our newborn child or our grandchild. Or to hold them for that very first time. Giving thanks for the opportunity to give a hug goodbye. Knowing we had time together. We have so much to be thankful for. There was an experiment that was done in New York City in Central Park. This was done by an advertising firm. Very interesting. They took a man, they dressed this man up as a, as a made him look like he was a blind man, you know, gave him a, a cane and, and set him down and they uh, put some eye drops in his eyes so his eyes would look as if he couldn't see very well. And they sat him there on the edge of the park on a nice day and put a cup and then hung a sign around his neck that simply said, I'm blind. And he sat there with that cup and it was a beautiful spring day. And he sat there for hours and only collected $4. The next day, another beautiful spring day. He went out, dressed up exactly the same, put the same eye drops in, sat down in the same place with the same cup. But they changed what they put around his neck. And it said, it's spring and I'm blind. That day he collected nearly $40, 10 times as much as the day before. Because it was that day that the people walking by him realized how blessed they were by the beautiful flowers and the birds and the grass and the sky and the sunset and all the things this man couldn't see. And they decided to be generous because they felt blessed. There are so many benefits to life. We are so blessed. So much to give thanks for. At the very least, we can give thanks that we are forgiven and we are free. If you're struggling, wondering where you can give thanks today, give thanks that God loves you. We love you. We are glad you're here. And God has forgiven you if you love him and know him. So at the very least, you've got that. And it's a place to start. Not only should our thanksgiving be expressed and expanded, but here's the third and final one. Our thanksgiving is actually expected. Paul says we are to give thanks in all circumstances because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is God's will for us. And he knows that if we will just do this, if we will give the thanks that we are supposed to give, that then our lives will be changed. This is the mark of a growing Christian. I remember when my son was born. Our son was pretty colicky. It was a rough first few years. He didn't sleep well, just tough. So when I'd pick him up and I'd pat him when he wasn't sleeping well and I'd walk him and I'd rock him and I'd you know just try to soothe him, Not once did he say, hey, thanks, Dad. Right? 
I mean, I put him down, he'd scream more. But never did I get a thanks. No thank yous. A child has to be taught to be thankful. It doesn't just come naturally. Sometimes, we know this if you're a parent, you almost have to force your child to be thankful, don't you? How many times have you, and me, I'm the same, had to say, and what do you say? Right? Implying, you need to say thanks. And what do you say now? Go tell grandma thanks. I say that all the time. Go tell them thanks. Did you tell them thanks? What did you say? Go tell them. They have to be taught. It doesn't come naturally to us. So we have to work at it and be intentional. In the last year, I've been here heading towards two years. I've seen some amazing blessings here in this church, folks. God is doing some good things. We've seen people baptized. We've seen new people come. Our youth group and youth ministry is growing. We are frankly reaching the point on Wednesday night, we're going to have to move a wall in the basement so we have more room for our youth group. Awesome. Praise the Lord. If I have to kick down a few more walls to make more room, let it be. We'll figure it out. We'll find a way. God has given us some opportunities here, folks, and some challenges that are the good kind of challenges. And I want you to know, and I want you to be excited, and I want you to give thanks, because I don't want this to run past us and us to miss out on the ability and the opportunity just to stop and pause and go, God, you are working here. We are seeing it. Lives transformed. Eternities changed. Thank you, God. Thank you for our church. Thank you for people who pray for us. Thank you for people we get to serve with. Thank you for people who faithfully take care of the money and and give it to missions and send it to the far ends of the earth. Thank you for Sunday school teachers who are dedicated to get up early on a Sunday morning to come in and teach. Thank you for Wednesday night youth ministry people. Thank you for people who cook and people who serve and people who clean and people who do stuff behind the scenes that nobody will ever know, but it gets done and it's amazing because... That's how the church works. We're a hand, we're a foot, we're a shin, we're a knee. We're all part of the body. We have so much to be thankful for. I don't want you to miss out on it, to let it run by. Give praise and thanks that we have a building and a place to come where you can hear the word of God proclaimed regularly, openly, without fear. Praise God for our blessings. James 1.17 says that each and every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and it comes down from the Father of lights. When we go to a restaurant, we're more than happy to give our waitress a a 15% tip when she gives us good service, right? For some reason, it can be difficult for us just to give thanks to God for all that he has given us. So we have to ask ourselves, are we truly thankful? I think we are, but sometimes we're careless and we forget to give thanks. Thanksgiving is the mark of a growing Christian. The psalmist was right. It is good to give thanks unto the Lord. Every day, folks, that we draw breath is a chance for us to thank God. And today, my challenge to you is exactly that. Find ways today and this week to give thanks. Don't let it just be one day in November every year. Live a life of thanks because it will change your life and it will change those around you. And not only that, God tells us, as Christians, that's who we should be. Find ways to thank Jesus this week for his blessing in your lives. For he is worthy of our thanks and our praise. Amen. Let's pray.